Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, Giovanni, Shiloh, and Manisha. Welcome, everybody, to a mini episode on Fortress on a Hill. I'm doing a paper or a podcast episode for one of my writing classes. And I wanted to talk to Giovanni, our co host, about the anti war veteran community today and what my thoughts are on what's going on and just kind of talk about the community a little bit. So, hey, Giovanni, how you doing? Doing well. How are you doing? Here. I'm good. I'm really good. So I just wanted to ask you, uh, what do you, where do you think that since you worked in About Face and you have a little more like knowledge, I guess, about the movement, I just wanted to ask your thoughts on where do you think things are today? Like how many, uh, how many do you think that there are approximately veterans who would identify as anti-war? I mean, so where I was in the, in the About Face, there were, um, so I was in the block phase for about six years. I was the, uh, the new member coordinator. I was in staff for about six years and, uh, and also, uh, so I coordinated with new members and I, and I plugged in new members to, to try to different other older members in the area or more, you know, more strange members in the area, et cetera. Right. When I first started working, I think I started working in 2015 on the, uh, on the staff and According to our books and numbers, there were about roughly about about four thousand people, four thousand people that were that were registering as as members, right? However, not all of them were active. I mean, out of the four thousand, just a percentage were active. Uh, then we did a cleanup of you know we sent out uh, messages, uh, just people replied back, to see how people were still interested, and you know and 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 being active, like in the org, or, you know, uh, came down to, I think it was 2000 or 2000, there were like, uh, roughly about 500 or something dues, dues period of people that, that, uh, that, that constantly pay their dues once. Uh, but yeah. Thanks. The 4,000, that's more than I thought. 4,000 is not a bad number. Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, when, when we came down, when we started you know, sending emails and, you know, phone back and ask people to reply when not, I mean, was still interested and came down to like about 2000, uh, people that still wanted to connect that and still wanted to be, you know, receive our, you know, their emails and, and being some form of shape, be, you know, uh, connected to the org. But when it came down to people that were active, um, it was less, it was, it was somewhere about five, 500 or so people that were still doing active and people that were still doing paying members. Nice. Uh, what, what would you say were the main ways that you guys would communicate? Like, uh, what kind of, how would you communicate mostly and organize and stuff? Oh, so we communicated with email, social media. I know that when, when I was leaving, we started adopting I mean, text banking, text some people. I don't know. Yes. Those were the forms of, you know, and, and just good old fashioned uh, phone call, you know, particularly people that are, are more active, you know, they would get. Like for example, when I was a, when I was a new member coordinator, right, that was my thing was to actually, as people join, you know, they'll get a phone call from me. They'll get a call, a phone call within a week or so, you know, uh, and an email, you know, it's in telling them that we received their application, et cetera. And then they follow up with the phone call so, um, and we followed up with a new members coordinating a new members, uh, um, Welcome uh, call. I will give him the history of the org, the, uh, the bylaws, that were the culture of the, of the org, and some of the actions that have done in the past. And then just ways to get, get plugged in, ways to be active, whatnot. Those new members orientation. But yeah, so I was, so I was the main way of connecting with people. And I would probably connect with other members around the area, and hopefully they will continue with getting plugged in and doing things together. Uh, also have a new members leadership class that I would give people that wanted to be new members, uh, coordinators or leadership regional area. So in the state and whatnot, uh, they came in and pretty much, I pretty much equip them and train them and how to maintain, how to keep people, you know, ways to keep people active and ways to do different campaigns and do different things, you know, how to start a campaign in, in a little campaign in the area and how to 
Oh, you're still going to get people active because the thing is that, you know, you join an organization, you join, you join the, the about face movement because you, something shook you, right? Something shook you and you wanted to do something about it and you find an organization and that's what you join, right? Uh, however, it's easy to, because at the moment you're hot, at the moment you want to do something, but it's easy to cool down and just keep it in your back mind. So. Because particularly if you join some, an organization that that's not really doing anything, you know? Uh, so I was trying to, trying to get people active in their area, try people involved in their area. And if there wasn't anyone active in their area, you know, I was trying to equip other members in how to be active in their area, you know, how to plug their right. into the ground, how to get connected with the other orgs around the local area and just build something, you know? Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I wanted to switch gears a little bit, uh, just cause I found some really interesting studies on masculinity in the military and masculinity and the military, as in, you know, talking about the ideas that we talk that I would like the military spouses or, you know, being a soldier or like being in the military is seen as like a very masculine thing to do because you get to be a part of war, which is obvious, like the most ma masculine quote unquote thing that you can be a part of. And it was interesting because I found this study that talked about it in specifically in anti-war veterans, the idea of masculinity. And so they kind of go through these different um, modes of identity that people have, you know, there's the personal identity, there's the collective identity. I'm a part of a group. There is the U S identity, like I'm an American. And then there's the military identity. I am a part of this branch. And so the idea is that uh, there's this idea of military masculinity and because it's a strong connection between war and masculinity. And uh, in this paper, they say military masculinity is one privileged form of masculinity in the USA and many Western societies and thus a type of hegemonic masculinity. Military masculinity includes a set of beliefs, practices, and attributes that can enable individuals, men and women, to claim authority on the basis of affirmative relationships with the military or military ideas. In military I masculinity has these sets of ideas that you get to be a part of that reinforce that idea of what a man is. And so when you're changing your mindset from, I am very pro-war to now I need to, I'm, I am not. You know, there can be a shift in yourself about what masculinity means to you because you're not identifying with those same parts anymore. Yeah, keep in mind that most people that want to join the military young, they still find themselves transitioning from adolescent to adulthood, right? And then there's some there's some expect expectations of you, and and it could be very scary for people that graduate in high school to really have an idea what what to do next. You know, some people have their you know life life lined up for them. You know, we're in college, blah, blah, this and that. And, you know, my parents, you know, my father owned this business and I'm going to, and I'm working with my father and now their business, you know, so people have their lives lined up for them, but some people don't, uh, and some people still trying to find, you know, where they're straight in, you know, particularly in the society that we live in, we live in a very, uh, uh in the, in hyper individualistic society, you know, uh, a very liberal society and in, in, in that sense that where where the the most important um, atom, the most important being is is, is the self, right? That's what classic liberalism is, right? And but that that goes really against the nature, against human nature, because we are we are as animals, we're a collective, right? We we've always been collective since a species, then since we're you know since we came out, right? We always roam in in, in small families and bands, and from bands to class, the tribes, the tribes, the nation, right? Our society is very individualistic in the sense that it's easy to be lost. It's easy to feel lost. It's easy to not feel being a part of a larger group is kind of like calling. That's why people want to join, when they go to college, they join uh, uh, fraternities or sororities, right? You know, being part of a group. Yeah. So, so it's yeah. 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 You know, like, I mean, yeah. All so those that's, things that we could use. <laughs> that's a con that that is the condition that is a, a something that's very you know innate ingrained and, and uh, you know hardwired and let's see, the culture we live in a very individualistic culture is very contradicting how we are wired. So when you join the military and 
you join that bondsmanship, you know, particularly like I spent, I spent a lot of time in an infantry, right. And in combat arms. So that was very bonding. I remember, I remember seeing our older NCOs, you know, like they love going to the field because it gives them an opportunity to get away from their family, you know, so, you know, it gives them a break from their family. Right. <laughs> um, and then just, and that's some of that's same reason people go hunting, you know, they go hunting with the guys, you know, because they have that, that male bonding, right? So that's what the military represents to a lot of people. And it reinforces that. Uh, but it's also, depending on what kind of family you come from, they come from a very conservative family, you come from a, a close knit family, you know, where there's expectations of you as, as a young man, you're supposed to take care of your family. You're supposed to be a good citizen. You're supposed to take care of your community. You're supposed to be honest. You're supposed to be polite to your elders, et cetera, et cetera. So you have these expectations, right? Which the military, which the military kind of, uh, reinforces and people that want mass if I'm getting off track of what you're trying to say, but, but that's one of the, that's one of the things that, that it, that's one of the attractions that, 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 uh, that brings people to, you know, to attract towards this institution or this, uh, um, society because it's very close, it's a close in society because it's. It's a microcosm in a way as well of the larger society the hierarchy. There's clear lines. There's kind of an expectation of you. You know what you're going to do the next day. We function better when there's structures than when there's chaos. So there's one thing that I remember saying that people like to be told what to do. And what I mean is that this is a, a, a chaotic situation. Let's say there is a fire in a building. People always look, people are looking for, there's two ways to react to it, right? There's a fire in a building, people just running all over the place, ah, just running, trampling over each other, right? Or there's just one person who take role, take lead, right? And tell people, all right, guys, just line up, let's go down the fire stairs and we'll meet outside in the, uh, in the parking lot, right? And then people just rally up and we just line up and they go down the, the, the stairs and they're, and they're in the park and and they'll find, and they'll rally up in, 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 the, in the parking lot, right? So there's two ways of, of seeing things, right? So. Most people respond to that type of, to a, to a type of leadership when particularly when a moment of chaos. Um, and that's one of the things that people find that structure that people find attractive to the military. Now, I remember, it, remember what, what I said earlier that you grew up with certain, certain values, you don't steal, you don't cheat, you don't lie, you know, some particularly if you come from a family that hold those values, conservative families that hold those values, you know, or not, uh, then you find yourself that you participated in an action. And then you find yourself that you were lied to, that you were cheated, that you were lied to. Um, and it becomes a shock to the conscience of the person, right? And then people in the military that are found with, particularly I'm thinking about this war, it's still called global war and terror, right? Which didn't make any sense to me, didn't make any sense from the beginning. It's, you know, terrorism is a military tactic. How can you wage war in a military tactic? But yeah, when people find themselves in a situation when they feel that they were lied to, so that they were taken advantage of, so that their innocence was taken away. You know, they feel that they, that they have certain sets of beliefs, you know, that you're joining this institution because, because X, Y, and Z, but now you find yourself that you were just a tool that could be a, a crash to reality of not people. And the people, there's two ways to deal with it. There's two ways that I've seen people do it is they suppress it or they'll continue on with their careers. They retire and say, they don't even think about it. Right. And there's people that dwell on it and there's people that, that is just too much to bear and they just end up leaving the military. Right. Uh, particularly I'm talking about the community of the anti-war, but you still long for that sense of community. You just can't, uh, deal with the contradictions of the military, the destructiveness, you know, the dehumanization of, other, of others. And then within the military, you see that as well, because now I was talking to one of my, my friends and he was the, uh, he was a little member of Bob Face member and he was a, a paratrooper. And we were talking about some brilliance about uh, the structure and the internal structure of the military. This, this kid, he was thinking about joining the military. We were tabling at the university. And then what he was saying is that he was a paratrooper. He was a like, second airborne. So when we join the military, right? Now you are part of this organization. You wear your uniform, uniform represents authority, you know, sharpness represents some type of, um, structure, some type of discipline, uniformity, right? But that's, that's, that's what, that's what the uniform represents. When you have that, you know, you feel yourself, you're a higher caste of society. Now it's, you see civilians that as kind of children, they don't know any better, they're in it then, blah, 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 right? And it's your, and you're the protector and now you wear the uniform and you're kind of above, right? You're, you know, you're the super student yeah. now. Um, 
But then within the military, you see the same thing because uh, it replicates the same thing in the military because now you're in combat arms in the infantry. The infantry uh, see the rest of the people that are not in those combat arms as beneath them, as weaker than beneath them because I'm an infantryman, right? I was a medic in the infantry. And the medic, you have to kind of prove yourself to the infantry guys that you can do the same thing and better than them because you only, not only you're carrying the amount of equipment that they're carrying, right? So you're participating in the road marches, you're pulling guard duty with them. Uh, and the other things you got to try to prove yourself so you get to, you get to respect from them because if not, they'll see you as beneath them because you're a medic in their infantry. So then so you have that, that, that cast in the military, right? You know, I'm the infantry man, uh, and you know, a pencil pusher in the office, right? He's beneath me, right? Uh, then within that structure, right? Then you have uh, the Rangers, right? For example, all you know, the paratroopers, right? The time they leap and then they leap force within the, the, the combat arms, you know, right? So they see everybody as a, as a leg or a pole. They don't know any better because I'm, I'm a Ranger. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a paratrooper, etc. I'm a jump master, etc. right? Then you have the, the, the special forces community, which is a little bit different. It's interesting because I work with both. I work with the, with the, Rangers and a special forces community. Rangers tend to be more, you tell them, walk through the wall, they'll walk through the wall and ask no questions, right? The bone just, just just keep pounding against the wall, keep pounding against the wall, keep pounding against the wall, they ask no questions, right? I remember a friend, he was a special forces guy. He was, he was telling us different, right? And said, you know, you tell Rangers, put, you know, cut the grass with, with scissors, he'll go out there and cut the grass with scissors, right? And he would make fun of the, because it was in the office and it was a Ranger guy in the office. He would make fun of them all the time. And he was special forces. Guy, this was a little bit more lax, the uniform a little bit, looked like it come down of a, of a duffel bag, let the hair grow a little bit more, you know, this and that, but they have a different focus, different mission though. They see everybody else as kind of beneath them because they're really forced. So you see all those structures, those hierarchies in, in the military. That's helpful um, because yeah, you're talking about hierarchies and you're talking about the structure that you involve yourself in and the, the like different compromises you have to make for yourself basically. And so, um. You know, when you're getting out, then you have the time to reflect on everything that you did. You have time to reflect on your feelings about it. And uh, for me, I felt really like I didn't come into the military being like super gung ho, like hell yeah, America. I was very like, I understood that we'd done some stuff that wasn't great. But like for me, it was because I wanted the GI Bill and I wanted the benefits of going back to college and stuff where that or we read another article uh, in a paper uh, talking about identity and veterans and specifically what happens when uh when you're getting out and the process of reintegration what that looks like and how that can how the the ways that your identity shifts over the reintegration period can lead to and other symptoms so in this paper they talked about reintegration and so they said the process of reintegration to civilian life has been conceptualized as an abrupt culture shock that involves loss maintenance gains and transformation of existing identity structure given this context the social identity model of identity change may use may serve as a useful framework for viewing these changes so basically like it's a shock to your system because you're losing that identity, you're losing that brotherhood, that camaraderie, that identity that you had, and you're turning into whoever this person is. And for me, I thought, oh, I can just go back to being the person I was. And like, you can, but it's different. I mean, everything is like, you're a different person. You can't go back to being that like wide-eyed, naive person that uh, didn't understand all of what was going on. So, and then it may say, uh, as such, a successful transition to civilian life requires a transformational change in one's military identity and maintenance of existing identity structures. So, yeah, obviously you have to, you have to rethink everything that you did and why. What, uh, what do you feel like was... Yeah, what you did or what you saw, what you... Conversation you were a part of, you know, what you see other people do, and et cetera. Um, one thing that the military is that, uh, you always keep hearing is that, is that, uh, you're in the Navy, right? The Navy was, I think mm-hmm. the Navy, Navy had a different culture than the Army, but I'm probably the same, um, that, you know, you keep hearing that we rank come privilege. So I spent 12 years after doing it and two years reserves, right? So making that transition, the reason I went from active duty to reserve is to help me in that transition. As a move, right? And because to make sure that's what I was going to do. And also because it was, like I say, it was in a, a shock. 
Um, they also offer some type of bonus, whatever. Yeah, they also are some bonus to make the transition from active duty to reserves, et cetera. Um, and also even the military had a family, had children, wife married at a home. Uh, but with rank of privilege and, and life in the military is not really hard, particularly when you start moving in ranks and stuff like that, you know, your, you know, your training is paid for, you know, your supply for qualified to get, you know, you go to that school and you know, this training is paid for or we'll go TY, I forgot how the Navy calls it. You know, when you're up in the, in the higher echelons, you know, you go TY and they get paid to do these business trips and, and all that, particularly when you start going into those higher ranks, those, you know, I'm talking about enlisted here. You start becoming a seven, a chief, what you guys call a chief. Um, <laughs> start going to the E8 rank, to E9 rank, you know, you guys call it your senior, right? You guys call it the E9. E9 is master chief. Master chief, right? We guys, you know, we start, we start, you know, those are very high privileged positions. And then when you, when they leave the military, when they retire, it's like an emptiness, particularly when you're used to running things, when you have people working for you, uh, you can move from different positions, you know, people like they move different positions. You don't really have to interview for those positions. You got to do the check your limits and breakers, which you've done in the past. You have to like do this school, do that school, and then they have this other position, that atmosphere doesn't really exist in the, in the civilian world for most people, right? So for most people, when they, when they make that transition, when I mean, you have people work under you, for example, I was a section chief when I was in the military, I have people, I have like 36 people working for me at one point, you know, and, and that, um, for more, a lot of people that doesn't transition into the civilian world, you know, so they feel lost. I don't know if you heard of the stories about, you know, old, old master chiefs, right? You know, retired, they go to the BX or the PX, just to look at soldiers, just to reminisce, right? Hey, you know? Because they can't really adjust to the, they can't really adjust to the civilian world. That's the thing. I find that people that left the military and, you know, minus if it was, if, if they didn't take part of a war combat, they left the military, they did like two years or three years, four years, and they got out, I find that they, but they had an easier time to transition to the civilian than people that did over 10 years, 10 years and then got out. And you kind of become institutionalized, um, in a sense. And Absolutely. You see that the civilian world doesn't really work that way. Um, so you see a lot of people that spend a lot of time in the military when they retire, when they get out, they find, they try, they look for other jobs that are, that have similar structures. You know, they join the police department, they join border patrol, they join a security firms or whatever. This night they try to find the same kind of structures, fire department, fire, you know, same kind of structures that they have while in the military. That's what I find. I mean, I said minus, minus people that went to come war. Look, it's just been deployment. They have a, it's a different dynamic. And now you're adding other stressors on top of it. You added PTSD, you added, you added moral injury to it, uh, as well, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much for talking to me today. I, it was nice to get a little more insight into the community and just, you know, your own personal experience of how you felt and that would be, uh, thanks so much for talking with me today. Money is tight these days for everyone. Penny pinching to make it through the month often doesn't give people the funds to contribute to a creator they support. So we consider it the highest honor that folks help us fund the podcast in any dollar amount they're able. Patreons is the main place to do that. In addition, any support we receive makes sure we can continue to provide our main epistos free for everyone. And for supporters who can donate $10 a month or more, they will be listed right here as an honorary producer, like these fine folks. Fahim's Everyone Dream, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Ren Jacob, Scott Spaulding, Spooky Tooth, Helgeberg, and Howard Reynolds. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. We're on Twitter and Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time.
my song. I hope you'll pay attention. I will not detain you long. <laughs> 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 